So you ready to go through some Bible verses? Yeah, yeah I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of an overview of uh, the why behind the classes that we're going to be running on Wednesday night, like how we got here, right? So Trisha and I came out here in 1999, actually moved out here, and we started, uh, uh, the church started as a Bible study in the Basking Ridge Fire Company, and we had had quite a bit of experience with this material at our prior church before we came out here, and we knew the power of helping people walk through some of what we will be talking about uh, here. And in fact, when we, when we started the church, we had all the people that were coming in, in a leadership position also go through the, the, the formal training, which was then called the Elijah House Ministries. And it was uh, 18 weeks for four hours, every Friday for 18 weeks. So it was a really big commitment and, and a great big corpus of material that we went through, all biblically based, but all done through the lens of John Sanford and his wife Paula, and John's dominant gifting is the prophetic. And there were many, many insights in the material that he had as a counselor for 40 years, in addition to having been a pastor prior to that, that he developed, that as we've gone through this material, many people have said to us, I've been a Christian a really long time, but I've never seen this before. Nobody was, was, was talking about this material before. I wonder why. And I, I would say, well, not everybody's married to Trish. <laughs> because frankly, I'll be honest with you, her gift is really strong in helping discern spirits in people. And if somebody's got a physical problem, there could be a spiritual root to that problem. You understand that, right? And because we were seeing many people get free, then you know what happens. If somebody gets free, it's like they're a different person. And they go tell their friends, and it's like, wow, whatever happened to you, it's, it's sure real and it's authentic. And that was how the church grew, through changed lives. And what a great way of evangelizing, right? Because it's real. This really works. There's power. We don't just sing about it. There's really power to get people free. But there's also an aspect of it that, that requires a willingness on behalf of the people who are doing the prayer ministry to be very patient and willing to hang in there and wait and listen to the Lord. And, and there, there, there could be a three-hour long meeting where you're, where you're really going at it, uh, for, not with the person that's receiving the counsel, but, but digging in to find the root of the problem. And that's not how most people spend their days every day. So it takes a special breed of people to do that. And Trisha also has a gift of training people to do that too and, and helping them to be able to, to operate that way. And now we have a team of people that do that. So it's not always the most pleasant experience if somebody is going through a healing process where there was a lot of pain. But if, that, if the church can't be good at that, then I'm missing something. If you can't get help with your pain in a church, then something's wrong. That's what we're here for, is to help make the crooked way straight for people to the degree that we can. God has to do the ultimate work, but we can be the vessels that deliver that. And the verse that we use is called Possessing Your Vessel. That's a verse from 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians that, that I'll get to today. But the mindset is none of us have arrived. None of us are perfect. We're all Christians and we're on our way to the destination that God has for us. Here as well as future. And I'm going to make the most of my opportunity because of that fear of the Lord peace. That's the beginning of wisdom. I'm not going to show up before him one day and say I did a mediocre I made a mediocre attempt to serve you. That's not the, that's not the approach. If I'm in this, I'm going to be all in. Because it really doesn't work any other way. You see what happens when people start watering it down and trying to make it appealing and stop talking about sin because they don't feel comfortable confronting people about sin. But that's just the reality of the truth. And if you remember when you got saved, somebody probably had enough courage to confront you with, with the truth about the word. They, they hopefully did it in love. But that's what causes change, is they have to realize that what they're doing is wrong. And we're not helping the Lord or the gospel or the kingdom of God if we say, oh, no, that's not a sin anymore. It always was a sin, but it's not a sin anymore. We change the definition. That's contrary to the gospel. It's okay to talk to each other and hold each other accountable. We should be looking for that. Like I said, we all need each other. When I was on the football team, if three guys were out partying all night on a Friday and they show up hungover on Saturday morning, the chance of us winning the game goes down dramatically. We need each other to be in the top shape. We're all agreeing that we're making a commitment to doing this, 
And what this is is just living life and raising families and, and having a job and helping out in ministries and finding creative ways to express your gifts in, in that same effort to see lives change. So your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit. A lot of you would know this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He's in you and who you have received from the Lord. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So that's a part of the fear of the Lord is that I have an obligation not to sin with my body. I have to live within boundaries of my behavior. I have to throttle my appetites. It's not just okay to whatever goes. No, it's not whatever goes. This is part of how I express my walk with the Lord is what I don't do with my body. I live within the boundaries that he gives me. And then in Ephesians 4, his Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you. Isn't that a great picture? Don't you love that? That the Holy Spirit of God is moving in you and breathing in you and, and empowering you to help serve the Lord in, in, in an obedient way. It's the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. And don't take that gift for granted. Take it seriously that we have this amazing gift of God's Spirit inside of us and cultivate your relationship with him. Hebrews 12, there's no one person, I'm sorry, there's not one person who can hide their thoughts from God. For nothing that we do remains a secret. And nothing created is concealed, but everything is exposed and defenseless before his eyes. That should not cause us to be ashamed. Right. To whom we must render an account. Okay? So, back to my football analogy. I show up on Saturday, and I can render an account that I was in the gym all week. I took care of myself. I, didn't go, I wasn't out late last night. Give me the breathalyzer test, and I'm good. I, we may not win the game, but it won't be because I'm hungover. Right? We're going to do the best that we can from our side. And the Bible has a lot of these phrases like, as much as it's within your power, pursue peace with all people. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, that's a big one, isn't it? As much as it's within. I can only control my half. I can control the response. I can't control what they say to me that might be offensive, but I can control my response. If I yield to Holy Spirit in me, who will help me know the right way to handle it. Not in a hateful way. And I love the language here. We probably know it as pressing towards the mark for the prize. But in Philippians 3.14, I'm sprinting toward the only goal that counts. To cross the line, to win the prize, hear God's call to a resurrection life. And you'll hear us talk a lot about death, burial, and resurrection. Because it's not just Jesus who died, buried, and was resurrected. And it's not just us that will be resurrected at his final return. You know that, right? You're getting a new body. You're not cast with a friendly ghost floating around for eternity. You've gotten a new body. Man, if you really thought about that, you should be much happier. <laughs> this is like a resurrection life now, here. That old thing died, and he resurrected a new me that doesn't want to do drugs anymore and doesn't need to go to Grateful Dead con for concerts anymore. <laughs> it's like he's a new person. Gratefully alive, not grateful dead. <laughs> so Paul, being the very uh, pragmatic guy, right, he was very practical. He would go into a new town. He would get people saved. He'd raise up leaders, and then he'd go to the next town and do it again. Get people saved, raise up leaders, start a church, go to the next town. Not an easy life. And these are all people that were opposing him initially. And he's saying, he's given Timothy, who's one of his charges, or one of the people that come up under Paul's leadership. And this would apply to all of us here too, right? How, how, we are, how are we to live together? How are we to cooperate with God and with each other? Feeding hands could be an example. The worship team could be an example. There's a million ways that we could show that our, that our efforts together, the children's ministry on Sunday morning, where we're all operating towards a goal, well, we, we keep our lines of communication open and we keep reminding ourselves of the vision. And we, what we don't want to do is value somebody's gifting over their character. Right. Understand? Just because somebody's a great singer doesn't mean they should be on the worship team. Right. Because they might not be mature in the Lord. Right. And what are the temptations that somebody could face if they're very talented and beautiful? That people are going to just throw all kinds of uh, accolades at them and, and, and compliments. But we're not here to perform. Right. We're here to minister to the Lord, and that's not the easiest thing for people to understand, is it? So we could put somebody on the worship team, and it could retard their, their spiritual growth. It could, it could hold them back from growing in the Lord. No, we're not the police here, right? But, 
But we are expected, as Paul says, to discern before you put somebody in, in a position of authority, discern if they're ready to handle that right. and if they can take correction. Right. So we're going to have auditions for the worship team. We want you to audition, but one of the things we'd say is you need to go through this material that we're going to be doing for the next eight weeks to make sure you understand the DNA of this house. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Don't be too quick in the laying on of hands and thereby share in the sins of others. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? He's like, you better know who it is that's laboring among you, not because you think that they're, they're going to be a ch an axe murderer, but because there's a process here of growing somebody up in maturity. And, and this is an easy example on the worship team because as we've been taught most of our lives as musicians is to perform and to do recitals. And you get a lot of accolades if you do well, and you know nobody wa wants to know who came in second. They want to know who won the competition and the recital and all those things. And we can't carry that, that mindset into the kingdom. Right. right? It's got to be that we're ministering to God. And it's great if somebody's happy and, and, they're, and they're blessed by that. But it's very different than performing. Wow. It's not about us. And that's not an easy thing for people to grasp right away. It is once you explain it to them. And because we have a fear of the Lord, and this is his child, this beautiful girl that's singing and got this great gift, well, I could do her terrible harm if I don't let her know this. Because then the enemy could use that against her, right? See how this works? So that's one example. Then verse 24, the sins of some men are obvious going ahead of them to judgment, but the sins of others don't surface until later. <laughs> so you can make a mistake, and we don't want to make a mistake because we love you all. And not that the person's a mistake, they're just not ready. You don't give the keys of the jet fighter to the new recruit in the Air Force. They'll kill themselves and somebody else. Right? There's a, there's a growth process. There's a maturing process that we go through. And in the same way, good deeds are obvious, right? And even the ones that are inconspicuous cannot remain hidden. So that would tie in with the pr verse in Proverbs that says, your gift will make room for you and bring you before great people, men and women, right? So if somebody's got a strong anointing and they're mature in it and they're not spending all their time handing out their business cards and trying to promote themselves... Look, like, you don't have to do that if this is what Paul is saying here. The, the good deeds are obvious, and even the ones that are inconspicuous, even people who aren't real bold about promoting themselves, the, the anointing is obvious to people that are with them, right? So we're certainly not trying to hold anybody back. But if I could summarize it, maybe I'd say, we want to make sure that we're all in ministry for the right motive. Right. Not to build our ministry, but to build the Lord's kingdom. Right? And look, can we guarantee that? No, but if we try, are we going to be in better shape as a group of people? Yes. <laughs> Whether you got that point or not, I'll, I'll keep going here. Because this is one of, the, you know, one of those common kind of understandings is that you don't get into the leadership. <laughs> You're not steering the leadership until you pay your dues in the follow ship. <laughs> right? You've got to be a follower <laughs> before you're a leader. <laughs> So, like, a lot of people think, yeah, but I did this here in this other church four years ago. Great. That's awesome experience. But let's just get settled here. Just get into the rhythm of how things go here. We're thrilled that you have a lot of talent. And I've heard some people say, well, I don't want to start at the bottom of the ladder anymore. And then I just go like this. <laughs> he started at the bottom. <laughs> That's a pretty good example. <laughs> so... I won't belabor that point, but I also really like this phrase. It's, knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle. <laughs> oh, I could lead worship. Really? Okay. Well, there's a whole lot of spiritual warfare around that whole thing. You might be able to play the guitar and sing, but like, maybe, maybe not. Like, what's the experience here? Where have you paid your dues? Who's going to give an account for you as a servant? Who are you getting your pastoral reference from? <laughs> And what would they say? Oh, man, that guy was the most stubborn, obnoxious guy we ever had. Or, no, man, what a beautiful servant's heart, teachable, always open to correction. Like, you decide, who would you want on your team? <laughs> right? And God does this. He works on our personalities to get us to understand there's a bigger goal. Amen? There's a bigger goal. We're advancing God's kingdom. So we really have to be careful how we interact with each other. And often somebody's hung up on a problem in their lives that they can't make a connection back to where the root was. And as we go through this material, that starts to surface in the class. And that's why we want to do it in person. 
We want to talk about this material in, in this chapel on a Wednesday night so that you can get prayer. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of each meeting, there'll be people here that can pray with you. Because, wow, I didn't realize it. I've been holding unforgiveness against my father. Wow, that thing's been hidden under the surface. And tonight, the Holy Spirit revealed something to me that I see now as a key that's been holding me back. Anybody else have that happen besides me? When you go through this material, like so many hands going up. And there's so many testimonies around this that once the key was given and you got to the root, and that you can't kill it if you don't get to the root, right? If all you do is trim off the fruit at the top, it's going to keep reproducing. So that's the crucifixion part. We don't fix it. We take it to the cross, and it dies. And we say, God, resurrect that new person that you want me to be, the one I was always intended to be. Like we've said it this way, the world has never seen the real you until now. Because you were buried under all that pain and all that scar tissue. But now that you've gotten healed and delivered, you're like a whole new person. And that's some, often what they'll say. The family will come up and say, what happened to you? You're not the, and I won't use the adjectives that can be used there, the person that you used to be. And they'll say, I got healed. I got delivered. I got, I got set free by God. Because who the sun sets free? Come on. It doesn't get any better than that. And then each one of us, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, each believer has received a gift that manifests the Spirit's power and presence. Isn't that great? And it's all a little different. If you look at it as a gift mix, right? It's, all, it's like a fingerprint. That we all have just a little bit different fingerprint. So that the way Diana Jones sings up here and the way Brianna sings, they're both singers on the team, but they bring a different, ultimately the mix is a little different. And when we all blend together and we're in harmony with each other and we're, we're with everything that's within us, we're seeking peace with all people, right? Because together we can do so much more for the kingdom. Yeah. These gifts even flourish more because we can iron sharpens iron. We can help each other go, go further in God. What a powerful force that is. Of course the enemy wants to drive a wedge in between that and cause division over differences. But the gift is given for the good of the whole community. So we need you to flourish in your gifts and not get hung up on things that might be in your root system somewhere that in, in the right healthy environment, those things will surface and then you make lasting change because that old thing's gone. The body's not made of one large part but of many different parts. Imagine the entire body being an eye. How would a giant eye be able to hear? This is just Paul's example, right? You probably read this. But God placed each part in the exact place to perform the exact function that he wanted. And if I had to say one of the main things we can do as leaders here is recognize the gift in you and allow you to grow in that gift and allow you to flourish in that gift. Because when you're flourishing in your gift, the whole church benefits from that. The whole world benefits from it. Your family benefits from it. And that's what we want to do. So it's not a matter of keeping people up on the shelf that want to get involved. It's no, come on, jump in. If you haven't been through it before and you'd like to be involved, then come on Wednesday nights and we can help you. And then I'm just going to go through a verse that often gets thrown back at us. And it's in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And sometimes people come from a, a, a background where the pastor says, oh, those things that happened in your past have no impact on you now because it's all under the blood and, and you're a new creation and that's all gone. Well, it's true, right, that you got saved and you're a new creation, but you're not a mature new creation. The day you get saved, you're drinking milk. And I'm glad that my 35-year-old son is not still drinking milk. He knows how to eat meat now, right? So that's, that's a process that happens. We grow in the Lord. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and we go off the milk, and we go on the meat. But in 99% of your life, you could be consuming meat, but there could still be a place that got arrested that's still held back. And once that key gets open and you grow in that area, now the full you comes out. That's usually what happens. We're, we're high functioning in many other areas, but then in this one place we got stuck. And then the prophetic gift kicks in. And this is what Paul is saying. Our firm decision is to work from this focus center that one man died for who? You get the point. It's everyone, right? One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. All right? You'll see where he's going here in a minute. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could be included in his life. 
So let's just put a little scenario together. You're helping out in the children's ministry. How many here have done that in your career? Right? Not always the easiest thing because you can get a new family in and they don't even know the Lord yet, let's just say, and they never even heard about a book that could teach them how to discipline their children and their child is running crazy in your, in your class. What starts to happen in your heart? It's like resentment, like what happened? Like how did I get stuck in here today? Who are these people? Careful. He died for everyone. Everyone. Even that person. But we're tempted to just turn the dial a little when that mom picks up their child and took you long enough. Like, where you been? <laughs> That's the love of Jesus seeping through. But you see how you'd have to work on this a little? Because your flesh is just always right there, ready to give those sarcastic little one-liners. And sometimes it's bad if you're really funny because you think of really funny things to say. But they're very hurtful. And that's not, that's not the Lord. That's the enemy, constantly. Sarcasm is scarcasm. Okay? If you're finding a lot of sarcastic stuff coming up in you, there's some bitterness forming. Not a good thing. Look, everyone could be included in this life. The resurrection life. So this mom that you're dealing with now is not who she's going to be a year from now. Because she's just finding out about the Lord. And once you find out about the Lord, you change. And you, the way you deliver the love of the Lord is going to matter on whether she could hear you or not. And if you're like, wah, 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 your kid's a brat. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. That's why I dropped him off and didn't want to come pick him up. <laughs> I'm not saved yet. <laughs> Think that person's likely to come back again? Probably not. Do they need to come back? Yes. Yeah. Do they need to come back to a place that's got a strong enough immune system yeah. to resist that kind of poison that can be spewing? Yeah. yeah. But that's, not, that's what I was saying. We need each other to be flourishing. Because, but for the grace of God, that was me. Right? Like, so how, that's what he's saying. Like, everyone has to be considered. He died for everyone. Nobody got ruled out of the formula. But that means that the obligation on us is to treat everyone with the love of God. Yeah. Oh, that's not so easy. I don't like coming to this church. <laughs> because of this decision. What decision? That everyone gets a chance. That it's not selective. We don't get to pick and choose who we're going to be nice to. Because of that decision that we focus on that one man died for everyone. And that we all have an open heart towards the people that we meet. Even the most hurting. Now you might not be called to be in the counseling uh, you know, five hours a day for five days a week. I get that. But we have to have an open heart towards everybody because that could be us. And that person, when they get turned around, it's true. The world has never seen what that healed, delivered person could be and what they could do and the authority that they have on this side of the resurrection. It's a whole new person. And they have great insight into the problem that they dealt with because they've been healed from that problem. And that can help somebody else so much. Wow. So we looked at the Messiah that way once. Now remember, we don't look at the app. We don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Right. We're not looking at the car they drive or the education or lack of education that they would appear to have. This decision, everybody's included, means we don't evaluate people by the surface stuff. And Paul even says we used to look at the Messiah that way. Because how could he be the Messiah if he got crucified on a cross? He's a carpenter. We didn't expect the next King David to be a carpenter. Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> yeah, something good came. Pretty good. And he said, boy, we certainly don't look at him that way anymore. We used to look at Jesus that way, but not anymore because now we saw the light. Now we look inside. Whew. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. So when that mom comes to pick up that child, you don't see the package on the outside saying, Lord, show me what you see when you see this mom. What is the combination to the lock of her heart? What words could I use to help her understand that the way her child behaved today wasn't great, but she's okay? And we're here to help you. Boy, could I give you some books to read. But you have to build a relationship with her. 
you have to, she has to know that you have no agenda. And once you know that, boy, you'll listen to that person, won't you? Because you have a lot more respect for them. That old life is gone. See, you're helping them grow out of that old life. That's what the church is here for, to be change agents, to bring the truth of the gospel into hurting people's lives and show them that God is, there's nobody too far away that God can't help them. Amen? All right. I'm getting a few amens. That's good. All this comes from God, who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. Think that applies to marriage? Yes. <laughs> when you look at your spouse, you don't think about all the things that they are not. You think, God, I'm so grateful I married this person because I love them. And would you please help them work on this thing over here? <laughs> and then he's like, well, why don't you work on it first and why don't you model it by example? Why don't you show her what it looks like to have patience? Mm-hmm. Know us by our fruit. <laughs> so this is the will of God. Say it with me. Your sanctification. Yeah, that's good. You know what that word means, right? That means that we're in process to become from the unholy state that we were in to a, a more holy state. We're being sanctified. We're being set apart for the work of the Lord. That's that same idea of growing off the milk and onto the meat, from being immature to being mature. And it, and it happens when you get in the fellowship right? When you just join a ministry and you start working in that ministry together, so many people here I know would say that the things they learned in ministry, like serving in ministry and church, have helped them tremendously in the secular workforce. I know that's true because I've heard people give testimonies about that because the principles that we learn here working together are completely applicable to what happens when we leave and go out to work on Monday morning because they're, they're the best leadership principles that have ever been created, and that's why the kingdom of God's not going anywhere. Right. Not going anywhere. It's better now than it's ever been, even though it's under attack. The attack just tends to shake out the branches. And the dead wood just gets burned off because you need a lot of backbone in order to stand up against resistance. You can't just... Never mind. I, I don't want to editorialize here. <laughs> This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. All right, now obviously he's talking about the sexual behavior, the boundaries on our behavior there, but it applies in everything that we do, that you possess this vessel in honor and sanctification. And that's not legalism, okay? It's understanding that, you know, the devil, just picture if you were going to get in the ring with Mike Tyson in his prime, right? Like, Mike Tyson in his prime was, like, probably the best fighter that ever lived. One guy, I think it was Michael Spinks, he, he didn't last 30 seconds in the fight. I mean, it was almost like the fight was over before it even started. As soon as Mike Tyson walked, it was like he fell down, the other guy, without even getting hit, which he was so intimidated by this. Well, when I go out in the morning, the devil's waiting for me. And I'm not eating a quart of ice cream before I get in the ring with him. I'm going to give myself the best shot. I'm going to be prayed up. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to be ready. But not because I'm in legalism. It's because I know the reality of the rules of engagement. And that if I'm not strong in the Lord and strong in his word, then the chances of me messing up go way up. So it's a blessing to be able to pray and read the Bible before you leave in the morning. Lead me not, Lord, into temptation temptation today. Deliver me from the evil that will happen. I always pictured it as this is the path I'm supposed to walk. There's all hidden landmines by the enemy. But Lord, make me aware. Bring my discernment up. Warn me before I get near any one of those things. And let me even turn that situation around. I'm going to go faster now because we only have, I'm, I'm running over time. I'll end here because this is probably one of the things I learned personally the most. And, and now <laughs> Everybody that teaches this class will tell you that they had to come through their own process of uh, whatever you want to call it, digging down, finding things in there that weren't so attractive and needed to be dealt with, having to pull those things out and, and let them die and move on. And that makes us better at teaching it because we know it's not easy, right? It's not easy to change. Anybody here think it's easy to change? No. So let's just say you're married and, and your husband or your wife agrees that they want to change. If they, let's just say they're 40 years old and they never knew that the thing that they were doing was, was bothering anybody and now all of a sudden the light goes on 
You think it's going to be easy to change after 40 years? So they're probably not going to be very good at it right away, right? So what do they need from you? Don't roll your eyes. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, geez, how long is this going to take? You said you wanted to change. Well, wait a minute. No, you should be rewarding them for trying because it's hard to do this. And if they're trying to make a change, you go, look, man, you're making a massive effort because the old you would have done this, but you fought it. And you're trying to learn a whole new language, and it takes a while to learn a new language, doesn't it? And boy, we can't be hard on each other. The thing they need the most is for us to be encouraging them to say, you know what? If that felt awkward, don't worry about it. The next time you try to handle it differently, you're going to be better at it. Don't quit. And often, the people that want to change start, and they get rejected, and, and they just give up. But in Jesus' name, that's not going to happen. Amen? Let's stand up. This is a good chapter, uh, a few verses to read to end today, because uh, I think it's, it's going to be good to remember, if you are coming through this class, that... Uh, Love wins. Amen? Amen? Love wins. And most of us don't probably think about this too often, but if you did a general poll, let's say, of a population, and said, how many of you believe that most people are doing the best they can? How many think that most people are doing the best they can? How many people think they're not doing the best they can? Because if that's the best, that is pathetic. <laughs> right? Well, you may not be willing to admit it, but there are a lot of people out there that, that really are very harsh on other people for not performing better in, in one way or another. So we have to live as if, as if they are, right? And if their behavior is really like not happening, not, not what they're supposed to be doing, we still have an answer. Yeah. We still have a solution to that, and it's not to just avoid them. Right. It's to try to be the, the character of Christ to them that will, that will provoke them to want what you have. What a great way to evangelize, right? If you carry peace, they're going to want your peace. I didn't say carry a peace. <laughs> Be a 45. So, kind of read it out loud together. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, ready? Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boil over with jealousy. Is not boastful or vainglorious does not display itself haughtily. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Time out, okay? Can we just stop on that one for a minute? That's probably one of the hardest things. It's just, you know, you size up a situation. You've been taught, especially living around this part of the world where things move fast. Like, you, you read the situation, you think you understand it, but you could be wrong. You might be making assumptions and judgments and evaluations about that person that are completely inaccurate, right? So that's why I'm trying to stress this because it's one of my biggest takeaways was not to do that, not to form an opinion, not to jump to a conclusion. Wait and talk to the person. Don't just assume you know what they meant. You might have a wrong read on the situation for no fault of your own. You just, you read the situation one way, but that's not at all what they meant. And all of a sudden, now you're working up this whole big argument. You don't even know if that's what they meant because you haven't ever t taken the time to ask. So if this could be one of the things you remember from today, this would be a great lesson in my mind, is that the fear of the Lord in me says, I have to treat you and I have to believe the best about you until, until I have a reason not to. Amen. Right? Now, once you give me a reason not to, then, then there's something. Then I'm not jumping to a conclusion. But if we start out by believing the best about everybody, that's what it said, everyone gets a second chance with God, they should get a second chance from us too. Amen? Yeah. All right. So it hopes, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Lord, we ask you to help us with that kind of love. We ask you to open up our spiritual eyes, increase our discernment, improve our skills in interacting with other people. And instead of reacting to what we see when people are fuming or upset about something, that we could ask you, what do you see? when you look at that person, and especially if we're gonna get involved in ministry, that we would have that extra level of grace and patience and that ability to, to withstand some behavior that people have that might not be so healthy, but that we would be part of the solution and not part of the problem, not just calling things out for the obvious thing that we see, but to ask you for the solution, that we might just bond together in love and, and just help that person grow. 
because we're here to advance your kingdom. We're here to destroy the works of the enemy just like you did. And we ask you to just supernaturally empower us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Now you know the why. Whether you decide to do it or not, that's on you. But we hope you show up. Those of you that have been through it, you go on Wednesday night. You pray in the upper room. That's going to be awesome. If you want to come through the class, then we'll be here every Wednesday at 7.